Thanks, Anna. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Thanks for coming here tonight. I'm here kind of close to the heart of Silicon Valley. I think it's important to talk about um, entrepreneurship, which we all probably know and love, in the context of um, the, say, feudal economy and the history of democracy, which started in England, at least, um, in the 12th century. There were all these feudal powers. Um, the ruling classes had most of the, had all of the power and the vast majority of the wealth. Because they had all of this power and wealth, they viewed everyone below them, the common people, as labor. They were people to be exploited. They weren't so much a source of value for the economy. Then along came the merchant class. Um, and this was towards the beginning of the Magna Carta in England. They created, they started creating wealth. They were trading, um, creating added value, producing more high quality goods. Um, and this was around the same time that the ruling classes um, were losing some of their wealth. They did not have the castle coffers as well filled up as they used to be. So they decided to trade some of this power for some of the wealth of the merchants. Um, this was the beginning of entrepreneurship, the beginning of a, pe a more people-centered uh, government and economy, which gradually transitioned towards the dem democratic state that England is today. So it's quite a peaceful transition. Now this explanation, I should mention, comes from Iqbal Qadir, who is himself an entrepreneur. He's actually the Bangladeshi who started the first mobile phone company in Bangladesh in the early 90s. So after this was highly successful in Bangladesh, it spread on to the rest of Southeast Asia, Sub-Saharan Africa, um, throughout Latin America, even though initially this was seen as something completely new and insane. Why would anyone need telecommunications in the rural um, emerging markets? So he viewed the creation of wealth as what he called the invisible leg to sort of kick up the economy and create a more democratic society. In contrast to Adam Smith's view of, the, of capitalism as the invisible hand, which basically pushes down from above and persuades purely selfish actors to be more altruistic for the good of the economy. Uh, now this is a lot to take in. Is this making sense generally to you all? Excellent. So we're going to fast forward to the colonial powers. Um, this is here a conquistador claiming the land in the name of um, the king of Spain. England obviously was very good at this as well. And this disrupted the delicate balance between power and wealth, therefore reducing the common people to laborers. They are people to be exploited. The colonial powers end up extracting wealth from the people, giving that back up to the ruling classes, therefore making it very difficult to have a more people-centered government. Now, the colonial powers rebelled. Today, we have very little colonialism. Instead, we have neo-colonialism, new and exciting form of colonialism perpetuated by folks like the IMF. Um, who says here, I structurally adjust this land in the name of economic growth. So these neo-colonial powers, um, and they're not just multinationals, they're also governments um, and corporations, are basically acting the same way as the colonial powers did in the past by keeping the general people as laborers rather than wealth creators, extracting wealth from them and giving small amounts of it to their puppet governments. Um, or just governments who are incentivized to uh, cater to the international economy, the neo-colonial powers, rather than the common people. The main issue with this here, as with colonialism, as with feudalism, is that the people in power have very little incentive to lift up the common people and promote sustainable people-centric development. Um, concrete example, the country of Haiti, which was, had a huge um, slave revolution, uh, in which this was a former French slave colony. They rebelled, massacred most of the slave owners and many of the other um, white people on the island and declared themselves the first free colony after the USA. 
Um, this was a good 100 years before, 150 years before the majority of other colonial nations declared independence, right? It was all great, briefly. In 1820s, France surrounded Haiti with um, essentially their Royal Navy, demanded reparations to the tune of 21 billion in, US, in current US dollars. They said, you have massacred our people, you've destroyed all of our value, we want our money back. The Haitian economy never really recovered. Um, for over the next 100 years, most of the money was being exported to France, um, and this debt continued under um, the sort of auspices of neoliberalism. Throughout the 50s, you had the US um, came in and said, we're gonna help you all develop by destroying your farmland and a lot of your communities and building hydroelectric dams, which provided a bit of power, but also destroyed large swaths of fertile farmland um, and whole communities. From the 50s to the 80s, Haiti was led by two very violent dictators, oppressed a lot of the people, but promoted the neocolonial powers, notably um, the ideal of neoliberalism, meaning you should open up your doors to anyone who wants to come in um, and do trade with you. This was disastrous for Haiti, keep in mind, because they've been in debt to France for the past 150 years. They never really had a chance to build up their own local industries. So suddenly, their entire market is flooded with foreign goods, um, including an awful lot of agricultural products that could have been grown locally. Um, in 2004, finally, the Haitians were sick of neoliberalism. They elected a more I'm um, an anti-neoliberal president who was promptly removed in a coup, which was probably backed by the US government, this being another tactic of neocolonialism. In 2010, after a devastating earthquake, they received tons of aid, which sadly couldn't actually go towards the Haitian economy, because keep in mind, Haiti at this point is purely agrarian, if they can even grow anything, and can't produce their own goods. So most of this aid had to go towards international specialists and well-educated folks who could come in and determine what infrastructure to build, as well as to the foreign governments, often the same ones providing this aid, because they were the ones who could build the tents and create the medicines um, and set up the infrastructure, bring in portable toilets, etc. So today, Haiti is still the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere, despite all of this time that they could have had to develop an economy. On a more uh, colloquial note, this is a photo I took walking around in Ghana. These are semi-processed goods. Um, you look around this food stand. Now, Ghana um, in West Africa, one of the most fertile countries in sub-Saharan Africa, really great land, um, decently educated people. The economy is doing pretty well right now. But you'll notice this rice is all called Uncle Sam rice. So where does this food come from? Well, the rice all comes from the US. Um, except for the jasmine rice comes from Thailand. The tomatoes over there, and Ghanaians grow tons of tomatoes, and many of them rot because they don't process them. Tomato paste comes from Italy. Um, their pineapple and mango juice comes from Spain. They have tons of pineapples and mangoes, but they don't have, but Ghana doesn't have the juicing station set up. They don't have the industry. Um, and the oil in those jars is seasoning oil with shrimp powder in it. The shrimp is the only thing on this table that comes from Ghana. The oil, in fact, comes from the Netherlands. So, neocolonialism in action. And you can see there's a lot of Uncle Sam rice here, which is not a coincidence because we in the United States are, in fact, the um, leading neocolonial power. It's the only thing I gotta say. Sure. Sorry? True. So this is only processed foods. Um, actually, Ghana imports chickens from Brazil, which are fed with US grown corn. Um, frozen chickens all the way from Brazil because they have more meat on the uh, But they do have their own goats and a lot of their own chickens um, and cows and all those things. So yes, Ghanaians do eat a lot of meat. Um, yeah, don't worry. Uh, they're not, I mean, there are many countries that don't eat a lot of meat, which are perfectly happy, like India and Buddhist countries. But um, yeah, Ghana does. So anyways, uh, here we are having our flag all over the place with Uncle Sam Rice. 
But we have a legitimate excuse. So what is the most legitimate excuse for subjugating people? I'll give you a hint. Think of the Romans. Democracy. Um, not quite, because this isn't really a democracy if we're um, creating their entire economy. Hmm? You don't go to open war with the people that you are giving products to? Yes, exactly. No war. So this goes back to the days of who's heard of Pax Romana. Um, where if you have one central power, you don't have all of these other smaller powers jockeying, um, such as, say, World War I and World War II, hugely devastating global wars, um, lots of small powers fighting each other. Um, so Pax Romana, in modern terms, America, world police. Woo. So we're actually surprisingly good at this. Um, it's... So it, um, from a the militaristic standpoint, if you look at all the naval bases we have, um, and these are only the obvious naval bases, keep in mind we've got a lot of military that um, we're funding in Northern Africa, um, as well as India and Southeast Asia, and probably Central America as well. So um, huge military presence internationally, but most political scientists, not all of them, but most of them will agree that we're currently at um, one of the most peaceful times in recorded history. So there, despite everything you'll read, despite what all of our presidential candidates are constantly saying, there is very little war happening now as compared to um, previous years. We don't have the colonial wars. We don't have um, homicidal invasions of like Vikings or Mongols. We don't have um, the post-colonial wars. We have a lot less ethnic violence. Um, this is not sort of across the world, but generally speaking, most of the world is more stable than it's been at other points in history. Um, however, this map looks a lot like the map of the British Empire, um, who is also promoting three Fs, this case, freedom, fraternity, and federation. So, the thing with empires is they don't really last forever. And another thing that uh, many political scientists agree on, although of course not all, is that our American neocolonial empire is kind of in its stages in the waning era um, of our world domination. Uh, if you look at how much debt we're into China, if you um, consider the fact that the global oil economy is going to undergo a huge shift. There are going to be a lot of changes, um, not this decade probably, but over the next number of decades. This is what tends to happen to empires. They follow the laws of entropy. So what can we do? Taking sort of for granted from here on through the rest of the talk that empire is generally not a sustainable state of affairs, how can we start promoting more people? Um, looking at the people and creating wealth from the general people um, who can then exchange that wealth for our power from the central governments, creating a happier, more sustainable world. Well, we've got entrepreneurship, and you know what we like to do? Help everyone develop. Yay. So um, here are some humanitarians. Here's a hint. They're the white people. Um, these are from Humanitarians of Tinder, which is an amazing website. <laughs> Tinder profile pictures <laughs> of some lovely humanitarians going and helping um, the poorer, darker skinned people of the world who can't develop for themselves. Um, now, there's some unfortunate um, connotations here. If you zoom into the map of the British Empire at the bottom, you've got um, some loyal colonial subjects looking, gazing lovingly towards their beloved mother um, British Empire. The main sort of mentality of the colonial world is this very patronizing view towards pretty much everyone who doesn't act like them. Uh, and this isn't really a sustainable state of affairs because when you're trying to focus on people and upgrading the value of the people, you don't really want to be going into a country and saying, well, clearly I'm better than all of you because I'm educated, um, because I have all of these privileges, etc." So the colonial mindset is something that um, if we actually want to be promoting entrepreneurship and sustainable development, 
that's a mindset that we need to get out of. Um, so Courtney Martin is, writes for, I think it's the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, talks about reductive seduction, which is when you look across the world, say um, Facebook, looking over at India, and thinking, we need to help you develop. Clearly, we have all of this development. Let's share some of the goods. Uh, Facebook created internet.org. Have you heard of the internet.org controversy? No, okay, yes, mostly. Um, with free basics, basically the idea is that um, Facebook will create a sort of walled garden of providing a couple of providing Facebook as well as a couple other Facebook sanctioned services for free for anyone across India. And they've been doing this called free basics in sub-Saharan Africa for a while and no one complained. India um, had a much larger like, hacker population as well as a couple business, businesses and mobile apps that were seriously excluded. So they got angry. So reductive seduction basically is when you look at the US, which still has about a quarter of our population, doesn't have internet, but if you were to try doing something like free basics or internet.org in the US, that's illegal because we have net neutrality. All right, reductive seduction is when you look at India and say, well, clearly their problems are so much easier to solve and they're so desperate to get internet that we're going to provide them free access to a couple services and then create potentially an entire generation of folks who think that Facebook and a few Facebook sanctioned services are free and the rest of the internet is something you pay for. So anyone who values net neutrality would know this is a serious issue. This is not the you know, democratic um, global superhighway that the internet's supposed to be for everyone. Um, luckily, uh, internet.org was shut down in what is India. Net Sorry? What is net neutrality? Net neutrality is the, um, I probably got the wording wrong, the basic idea that all services should have uh, this, when, the, when you go on the internet, you should pay the same amount of money for all services equally. So some websites don't cost more than other websites. Because once you start doing that, you end up, um, as opposed to this sort of democratic playing field where anyone who wants can put their content on the internet and anyone can access it, you have a couple people who have premium content and then the rest of the people. So it stratifies the internet in this very undemocratic way. Does that make sense? There are many, many articles online if you search for net neutrality. Yeah, you should. It's important. We, we promote it. So the lesson here, entrepreneurship can't be airdropped. We had this idea that all these top-down solutions, something like net neutrality or something like um, free basics, you can just throw them at people. And you know, magically, the development and the entrepreneurship will happen. But what we're actually trying to do, focus on the people once again, is teach folks to view the world as malleable. In the words of um, Sakar, who runs a wonderful makerspace in Nepal, you want people like this is my friend um, Ira, uh, this is my friend Bilal, who many of you might know. Um, he's Iraqi American, and he's been heavily involved in the maker movement here people who build things and invent things. He went over to visit his family in Iraq and his uncle had lost his lower leg due to diabetes um, and the embargo, so he couldn't get medications. And so um, being over here in Baghdad without that many resources, uh, his uncle has a very uncomfortable knee prosthetic. So Bilal, um, as an engineer, decides, well, let's figure out what the, what the proper shape of a better prosthetic could be. Um, so he scans his leg uh, and they make a good prosthetic and then he documents this and posts it on Instructables. And you can see up there, there are 8,300 people who have viewed that and perhaps made better prosthetics using all locally available materials, like wherever you are, cheap stuff. Um, may maybe they've made these for their relatives or for themselves. And the really wonderful thing about this is Bilal has now helped start two different hacker spaces in Iraq. There's one in, ba in Baghdad and there's one in Basra. And they're both thriving and full of awesome people who also get this mindset that the world is malleable, is something that you can take command of and shape, which I might argue 
is one of the most valuable things we in Silicon Valley can offer the rest of the world. Now, the issue is instead of focusing on people, we focus on technology. We have the idea that this, say, 3D printer um, and MacBook just radiate innovation. Like you stick them down, the innovation radiates everywhere, and then jobs just start magically popping out. There's just so much entrepreneurship, it's great. So this doesn't particularly happen, but this does. Um, people, this is Sandy, who's at the Philippines Communitaire uh, Makerspace out in um, Tacloban, which was uh, the area that was hardest hit by Typhoon Yolanda in the Philippines. And um, the docks are still completely destroyed, so they have very few good supply chains. So in particular, this is really frustrating for tiny plastic dongly bits, things like motorcycle helmet clips or um, attachments for uh, medical devices. Other, you know, maybe replacing farming equipment. Tiny little plastic things that don't need to be particularly strong and robust and can quite easily be printed on one of those 3D printers. So this is a helmet clip that she's made that's literally, that could literally save someone's life. So this is one of those life-saving 3D printers right here. This is like probably the only thing that I've seen that can actually <laughs> save someone's life that was created on a 3D printer. Um, we could discuss that in the discussion. So also, you've got um, more wonderful projects. This is Mushira in Egypt, who created a um, DIY laser cutter to help uh, local artisans in the Sinai region who do a lot of textiles and um, cutting up and sewing fabric. And so this laser cutter can engrave fabric as well as cut up um, is, is can slice fabric pieces very precisely and you can create new forms of art much faster. Um, on the right is Afat and his colleague at Way Lab in Togo, um, also in West Africa. This is a 3D printer they made out of electronic waste, so super cheap. And they have an idea to build them for schools across the country. So everyone can have hands-on experience with an actual robot that can print something physical and learn digital design and manufacturing, which, as you may know, will become pretty important for the future. That's awesome. Yeah, these guys are great. You can look them up, um, Risha Laser and W.Afat. So this idea isn't that new of technology just spouting innovation. Back in 2006, we had rural computer centers. They would spout innovation too. It was so great. Um, so actually, a lot of some of them were, say, installed in schools. Like maybe they were in. Um, in I've read about one in uh, was Peru. Yeah, Peruvian project with one laptop per child, um, which was a great low-cost laptop project that sometimes didn't take into account things like. Their entire operating system was in Spanish, and they were sending them to teachers, and Spanish was like their second or third language, and most of the students barely spoke Spanish, they spoke Quechua, and no one had any idea how to use a computer. So not only were they learning technology for the first time, they were learning Spanish for the first time, and the, te this, the teachers just found it really difficult um, to manage. So once again, if you remember this being all about the people, what the teachers did was um, created, they teamed up with like a local language activist group who wrote a whole bunch of content in Quechua in the local language and um, put that on the computer. So at least they only had to learn the technology rather than technology and language. Um, but again, the false notion of the sort of techno-optimist view that you just airdrop technology and boom, outsprouts innovation. Um, which goes all the way back to the 1980s with appropriate technology movement, um, rural technology centers. These here are ancient lathes uh, for metalworking and some woodworking tools, which also sprouted innovation back in the 80s. Uh, but one of the cool projects here was um, this in Ghana, an initiative, uh, the Ghana Regional Appropriate Technology Service, which created, it, which invented new local industries in collaboration with the folks by the side of the road, the informal artisans, and the un big technical university. So this here is a small foundry 
where they took old car engine blocks and other sources of iron, melted these down, and created these um, iron disks for grinding corn. So they created all of this additional added value for agricultural processing, which was pretty cool. Um, this wasn't the only thing they did. They also introduced beekeeping, um, making nuts and bolts, and their products and their new, the new industries that they sprouted can be found throughout Ghana. They created probably hundreds of thousands of jobs, which is, frankly speaking, more than the two programs after them, um, the rural computer centers and the maker movement thus far have managed to create. The fact is, still not quite enough. Ghana and Singapore gained independence both in the late 50s, both from Britain, relatively similarly sized economies at the time. This is the relative value of the Singaporean currency as compared to um, the Ghanaian CD. You can see there's quite a discrepancy here. Singapore um, practiced a lot of very top-down planning. Um, they had a much more autocratic government who's also really focused on development and education and building up local industries in a way that Ghana, who kind of fell under the whole, do you have a question? Uh, who kind of fell under the neoliberalism trap that um, Haiti fell under too, didn't quite manage to boost up its own local industries. Just the previous slide, yes. you talked about the lathes and yeah. the foundries. Mm -hmm. What was the difference between those programs besides the fact that one was Was there a difference in the approach to those programs? That between this and so this one? You talked about the, yeah, so the, yeah. The, introducing lathes mm -hmm. seemed like a sort of local industry thing. Yeah. Um, and that being a failed thing with the sort of neo colonial maybe approach or mentality, mm. and then introducing foundries. This, Things seem similar to me besides the outcome. Right. Oh, sorry, good point. I didn't clarify this. So this is actually the beginning of the program, where they brought in all these tools and thought, all right, now we have these tools. Clearly, people are going to come in and create entrepreneurship. But it was actually this same program. And there's a great book which talks all about this, um, which describes the turning point for this particular, um, this is the same Ghana Regional Appropriate Technology Service. Their turning point being when they managed to inculcate this idea to the local artisans that they could make money off of what their, the services were. And as soon as the local artisans, a good question, as soon as the local artisans realize, oh, this is profitable, then you start getting hundreds of thousands of new businesses. If that makes sense, yeah. Um, thanks for the clarification. So yeah, back to Singapore. Um, very different model of development. So looking at somewhere like Ghana, we can ask these previous three programs, um, focusing all on grassroots entrepreneurship, why weren't they the incredible successes that everyone said they would be? Well, one of the reasons is a misconception of small-scale entrepreneurship. If you look at micro-entrepreneurs, these are small businesses by the side of the road. Um, they, if you start out with nothing, with very low capital and very low production, you have to work pretty hard to get up to that hump, and then everything kind of evens out, and it becomes sort of asymptotic growth. Um, this is from a great book called Poor Economics um, by Banerjee and Duflo. Highly recommend it. Uh, so they go and interview all these people and say, well, why aren't your tiny businesses growing? And these micro-entrepreneurs, they say, well, it's pretty scary. We don't want to suddenly start investing large amounts of capital because um, we don't know if we're going to get the returns back. And these businesses also, they're started out with the idea that, well, we'll grow them a little bit and a little bit, but they, aren't, they, they don't have the growth mindset of we're going to create this hugely successful multinational company. They have the mindset of, well, I'm going to employ you know, my daughter and my son and then maybe my nephew, and if it gets too big, then I don't really have any other kids that I can drag into this. So... Um, that might be a little scary. If you look at uh, larger businesses, they start off with quite a substantial chunk of capital. And so the other thing is, if you're thinking about some small scale like a mom and pop convenience store, you tend to have 
when you, when you get money in, you have to buy something immediately. You don't have a large amount of capital initially with the expectation of we're going to go into debt in order to succeed in the long term. So this is a significant challenge to the, to the notion that if you provide microcredit, um, all these people are going to start popping up with businesses which are going to scale hugely. The other challenge, um, which is talked about in a great Jacobin article recently, um, two months ago, is that when you start promoting entrepreneur, micro-entrepreneurship and you're not introducing new businesses, then everyone starts competing for, with the same products. Um, and you end up with a huge excess of supply, and especially if you're in a small rural village, not that much demand. So if you look at this aerial view of um, a market in Mexico, you can see all these shops are selling exactly the same vegetables. And it's convenient, everyone just go goes and lines up one stall after the other. Um, and if you were to provide a whole bunch more microcredit to other people in this area, they don't have new seeds. They don't really know what else people might want. Um, no one's particularly feeling that risky because, as I mentioned, they just want to get a bit of money and support their family. So, all right, that kind of sums it up for micro-entrepreneurship. How about large-scale entrepreneurship? Where are the people who want to grow giant companies? Well, let's start with the educated folks, people at least who are literate, who are the ones more likely to know about giant companies and how to grow them. Um, I did some informal interviews with a bunch of techies at the top technical university in Ghana, KNUST, and asked them, um, are you guys interested in entrepreneurship? And they said, well, you know, maybe, but what I really need to do is make money, I need to support my own family, and I need to support all my relatives who aren't privileged enough to get an education. So with that in mind, I've kind of got three options. I can work in government, or I can work in banking, which is almost exclusively for a foreign firm, because there aren't really any solid um, Ghanaian banks, uh, or I could work abroad. So you end up with this brain drain problem of really smart people pursuing more exciting opportunities in various other countries. Luckily, there are a couple of people who are thinking of this crazy startup. Um, and you know, they have to be pretty crazy because startups tend to have like a 90% failure rate. Right? I, don't, I don't know exact, the exact numbers, uh, but most VC firms are looking at if they, you know, they more than break even if about 10% of their firms are wildly successful, right? the unicorns. Um, so if you're looking at a you know, bunch of folks in an emerging economy who have a lot of pressures, um, they're not particularly interested in risking a lot of money and failing. The other thing is failure isn't really as appreciated in other countries as in Silicon Valley. Uh, like if you go to a VC here and say, hey, I failed at my first company, you want to give me money for the next one? They'll say, oh, you have experience, great, here you go. Um, my Ghanaian entrepreneurial friend says you go to a Ghanaian VC and they say, what, you failed? You must be an idiot, I'm not giving you any money. So that's one of the many more challenges to entrepreneurship, not least the fact that fiber optic cables are apparently really tasty to monkeys in India. But so you get bad internet connectivity, unstable electricity, insane bureaucracies, poor quality control for hardware, lack of infrastructure, um, bad roads in many cases, uh, international prejudice. You might never guess, but um, Nigerians are famous you know, for scamming everyone. So they also have some of the best anti-hacking software. And there's a lot of Nigerian software startups that um, have sold their products to Swiss banks because they're really good at stopping hackers. Um, but you can imagine the first Nigerian entrepreneur to go to a Swiss bank and say like, hi, I'm from Nigeria, I want to sell you some software to deal with your money. Right? Huge amount of international prejudice against otherwise very qualified entrepreneurs. Um, there's the family pressure to earn a stable income. Do you want to get married? Is anyone going to marry an entrepreneur? I mean, what does that person even do? Why not a doctor or an engineer or someone more stable? Um, you don't love failure, only Silicon Valley loves failure. There are probably many more. Yes? Yeah, one more around the bankruptcy protection. Oh, totally. Yeah. Yeah, that, um, and it's really hard to get a loan as well. Yeah, are there others that you all can think of? 
anyone started businesses in emerging economies? Uh, it just there's a lack of support from the community. Yeah. They don't believe that you could create something that an international company can create better. Hmm. So they don't want to buy your product. They don't want to invest time or even money for something. Hmm. Changing. Them. Yeah. Yeah, that's the thing. This is changing. Um, in many cases, it's changing because this is uh, Ghanaian entrepreneur Bright Simmons. It took him seven years to create um, a sort of mobile app startup to check whether medicines had expired or not um, by scanning ID codes. Really great idea. Not something that should take seven years in order to deploy. But he describes the next big idea somewhere like Silicon Valley as you're just a cog and you fit into this beautiful machine. And so there's this huge support infrastructure, as you were saying. And if you're the next big idea without the ecosystem, you're just going to sit there and rust. right? Or what you end up doing is building the machine, like you build the plane as you're flying it. And you end up creating this whole support infrastructure around yourself, which then goes and helps other entrepreneurs, um, which again, can raise up the whole value of um, the general people. So thinking about machines and infrastructure, um, I mentioned that I was talking about neocolonialism uh, and development aid at the Autodesk Foundation. And my boss says, do you know who rapidly brought half a billion people out of poverty? Does anyone know? Yes. China, massive scale, like this is not grassroots industrialization. This is massive orchestrated, organized production here. Um, huge, you know, PR campaigns, huge educational campaign, um, you know, policies that you may or may not agree with. Uh, we, we can talk in the discussion. Um, yeah, so. China is a somewhat debatable example, but the fact remains, they successfully brought half a billion people out of poverty. And it wasn't entirely democracy, but those in power really recognized the value of the people and the potential for wealth creation. Now, let's take a step back, like way back. One thing, when we're building up these new economies and new infrastructure, we do need to be mindful of what kind of world we're creating. Here um, is English speakers. It's a little hard. because if you think of the term progress, progress is actually neutral. If you look at the Latin, it means just walk forwards. There's nothing inherently better about walking forwards rather than walking sideways or walking backwards. But you know, we, we're using English. Um, England has a long history of industrial development. They're, first industrial revolution, progress is an idea that's sort of imbued with this positive connotation. A lot of languages don't have that. In Dutch, there are like three or four different terms for progress, and some of them mean positive progress. Some of them mean completely neutral progress. It's just sort of a natural progression of things. So one thing that we should ask more is modernization necessarily an improvement. Um, obviously, things like penicillin, uh, the green revolution in agriculture, are objectively good things for all of humanity. Things like computer centers, you would think, are probably great. But uh, Christopher Hodley from NYU talks about bringing a computer center back in the early days of the internet um, to a rural village in India. And there were a bunch of mothers who banded together to protest the introduction of this computer center. So the engineers who were installing this said, what, are you guys crazy? This is the future. This is progress. And the mother said, well, we've talked to some other mothers whose children became very computer literate and moved to the big cities in order to get a job and lived in these horrible, cramped areas and got really stressed out and led really unhappy lives. And we don't want that for our kids. So we don't think they should be learning about technology at all. We just want them to stay home and lead good lives with their families. So obviously, that's an extreme view. But it comes from a history of in, in India of serious debates around industrialization. 
So on the left is Gandhi as um, a law student, I believe, in South Africa, wearing a modern suit, nicely tailored. As he grew older, he came to the view that industrialization, he says, I'm afraid, is going to be a curse for mankind. Um, you can see him on the, as an older Gandhi with his signature spectacles, wearing khadi, which is hand-spun, simple white cotton. Um, hand-spun by weavers in India. And his entire view, which was pretty much roundly ignored, um, and ironically, one of the largest expo halls, which recently featured Mark Zuckerberg, as well as several other uh, Silicon Valley CEOs is named the Mahatma Gandhi Expo Hall. Um, but you chat with the Indians about this, and this is in Gujarat. People feel like it's not really, it, it's not really ironic. There isn't a particularly, there isn't a particular tension there, because these are all general ideas around development. And this idea, even though it wasn't followed, is something that's still very prevalent in a lot of people's mentality. Even more so in Bhutan who have the gross national happiness as an official indicator. And this, as written on the wall of a classroom, according to Wikipedia, the gross national happiness is more important than gross national product. There is a Cisco CTO who recently went over to Bhutan um, with the aim of introducing the internet and installing connectivity infrastructure. Um, the Bhutanese government said, you know, you need to talk more about the national happiness. Because when you give this presentation to all of our politicians, what we're looking for is how this is going to upgrade the happiness and the well-being of our people. So drop all that stuff about economic development. And she did. Um, you also look at in Cuba, um, Che Guevara started an association, and this is like the actual official logo for a conference, with Che on that side and ANIR on the other. It's the National Association of Innovators and Rationalizers, which I think is a pun. Is it a pun? It's probably a pun, meaning um, both like the rationing of technology during the embargo, uh, as well as rationality. So they created, uh, Motherboard covered one of their inventions, this little device which um, can recharge your batteries much faster, uh, just with a couple old scavenged, um, probably a capacitor and some other circuitry components. So this level of creativity is something that Cubans are worried as the rest of you know, the modern technological world starts coming in, are they gonna keep that kind of integrity and creativity? Or, are they going to start disposing of things on a massive level, like we do? Um, on the black market in Ghana, this is the Agbogboshi electronic wastes dump uh, in Ghana. On the southern tip, you can see it on Google Maps as a giant black smear leading out into the ocean. It is more toxic to humans than Chernobyl as of last year, after they completed the giant dome around Chernobyl. So the unfortunate thing about this is that it's increasing. Uh, your average mobile phone uses about a human's weight and resources. And this is something that is completely disposable. Like I have an iPhone 4, and when I, I can't install new apps anymore because it keeps telling me I need to upgrade to iOS 9, but if I upgrade, then my battery's gonna die. So we have this entire mentality of disposability, which isn't really something that the rest of the world can um, can use for their development. Because if everyone, if the entire world's population lived like us, we would need 4.1 planet Earths, according to per square mile worth of resources. Um, luckily, we're not the UAE, which would need 5.4, but they're a lot hotter, so it's kind of false comparison. Uh, our carbon footprint, five times greater than the average global citizen. This is all stuff we need, debatably, but it's not stuff that the rest of the world can have. The other issue is that um, here in Silicon Valley, what happens with high-tech entrepreneurship is you end up with this discrepancy between, in the US, the, um, average, the GDP and the average household income. This is kind of a symptom of um, rising inequality that 
when you create, say, the app, the, say WhatsApp, right? They were bought for, I don't remember how many billions of dollars, and that was a tiny team of people. So a huge amount of value created. Um, very few people actually benefiting from that value. So you end up with CEOs, um, with engineers, people like us, who are paid easily six-figure salaries, and the average American, or the average wage remains quite low. So as this continues, the other thing is robots are stealing our jobs, or rather we're giving, we're designing robots to take our jobs which isn't gonna be that bad for us. That's only 47% only of US jobs are automatable, according to the World Bank. You look at somewhere like China is 77%, China mostly has their act together. Ethiopia is 85% of jobs. So we should worry more, I think, um, that we're creating a new feudal economy where like this wonderful ad that I saw downtown a couple weeks ago says some people will be working on our chores and some people will be working on vintage bikes. <laughs> Feudalism, remember, when the working classes are viewed as labor. There is no wealth um, to be created from the working classes. They are to be exploited. The wealth and the power remains at the top. This is a problem because we're facing some really serious issues today. Um, we may have more peace than ever before. We also have more global instability from climate change. Uh, this is the Zaatari refugee camp for Syrians in Jordan. Right? Millions of displaced people, mostly as a result of climate change and destabilization, global warming. So when we think about how do we capture all hands on deck, the, historically, we would always look to the universities. But if you look at, this is church, uh, university education enrollment. Um, it's pretty heavily concentrated in a couple countries. I think South America is probably in this like 19 to 45% university educated realm. Uh, you look at somewhere like Sub-Saharan Africa, um, there are a lot of probably very smart people who aren't going to receive the support, going to benefit from the community that our universities can provide. Um, on a more personal note, I was a bit of a lonely nerd until I suddenly found all of these amazing people where I went to school uh, at MIT. And that community, that whole cohesive nature um, is something that really creates entrepreneurship. Like you look at Silicon Valley, sort of started around Stanford and Berkeley. You look at the biotech industry around MIT and Harvard, and there are many more wonderful universities across this country that are spouting out their own businesses and introducing people to one another. But there's a bright side. These are, remember all those innovation spaces that were just spouting out innovation? They're still there. There are about 3,000 of them worldwide. Um, we have a map if you want to find innovation spaces pretty much everywhere. Check out a Nazi group. Um, we're going to have them all listed in Excel spreadsheets soon. It'll be great. So we've got these spaces, which are kind of like attractors for smart, creative people and problem solvers and entrepreneurs. We've also got open course, um, all these online courses, uh, MOOCs, and other ways of learning Khan Academy, ways of learning things in informal ways. And we have the internet, so we're all well connected. There's this interconnectivity in both hardware and software. Here, for example, are some of these modern um, fab labs which are like maker spaces, but they're sort of part of a global network. You can design something in Ahmedabad in India at this fab lab here and email that design, say of a prosthetic hand or um, a particular bit for a wind turbine or something, email that to Iceland, which has exactly the same machines. And then you can collaborate in real time, sharing files because hardware is now you know, becoming interchangeable, all these bits and atoms, you can turn devices into software and email people your designs back and forth. This is even easier with mobile apps. You can invent something anywhere, push that to the cloud, and suddenly everyone in the world can download it. So what I'm saying is it's all about the people. People who view the world as malleable. Here, I don't think they came. 
um, but here are some of my friends um, from the Global Innovation Gathering, a group of makers and hackers and entrepreneurs um, from mostly emerging markets uh, over in Germany. All about the people. How do we promote the people? In summary, well, you should be aware of incentives, who's being incentivized by what, uh, maybe have a little bit more mistrust in some of our aid organizations um, and government-sponsored aid programs. Appreciate the complexity. Build local infrastructure. We need to engage locally and capacitate people locally. Also, foster entrepreneurial ecosystems. Don't airdrop things. Create mechanisms for entrepreneurs to fit their ideas into. Finally, be mindful of the world that we're creating because we've only got one planet. It is, after all, all about the people. Thank you.